Well, good afternoon. My name is Ryan Gordon and I'm the Family Forest Land Coordinator with the Oregon Department of Forestry. And it's my pleasure to be your host for this afternoon's Tree School online webinar. Tree School is a production of the OSU Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Program and the Partnership for Forestry Education. We wanna give special recognition to the Oregon Forest Resources Institute for leading this project and to the Oregon Department of Forestry and the US Forest Service for providing some grant funding to help make the webinar series possible. As a reminder, Tree School online webinars are scheduled every Tuesday from now until July 28th. There are two webinars each Tuesday, one at 10 in the morning and one at three in the afternoon. This afternoon's webinar will be given by Dan Stark, who is an OSU Forestry and Natural Resources Extension agent on the North Coast. Dan will be talking about planting trees, a topic that's really not as simple as it might sound. But before I introduce Dan any more, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping details to help get you familiar with uh, the Zoom platform and uh, a few other details that'll be important for today's webinar. So first of all, the Zoom toolbar should be located at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, you might need to move your mouse over it to help um, highlight it, it'll pop up. On some devices like iPads or mobile phones, the toolbar may be on the top of the display or someplace else. Most of the features that you'll, you'll need are accessed through this toolbar. Audio is muted for all of our participants today, and we'll keep it that way throughout the webinar. Um, video also is not available for participants. But we will be making use of the Q&A function for written questions. Uh, that's going to be your primary way of communicating with us and interacting uh, with us throughout the course of the webinar. Uh, and so I'll be monitoring that. And we're going to take a pause about halfway through the presentation, and Dan's going to answer a few questions. And then when we get to the end of the webinar, uh, we've got some more time set aside, and we'll try to cover them all uh, if we can before we wrap up for today. You'll see there's also a chat function uh, down in that toolbar as well. And uh, that's really for use primarily if you're having some technical issues or have other questions uh, on the side related to using Zoom. Uh, the chat's going to be monitored by today's co-host, Julie Woodward. She's working in the background to help me out, uh, especially if I run into any technical glitches myself. Uh, Dan may, though, ask you some questions during today's presentation, and your answers, if you want to share them, can be entered into the chat box, and we'll try to make them part of the conversation uh, the best that we can. So uh, the most important thing is that Q&A is for your questions. That's where we want to have you uh, put those, post those, not the chat. There are also a number of resources that are available for today's webinar and actually for um, all of the Tree School Online classes. And those uh, can be found on the Tree School Online class guide, uh, which is uh, located at knowyourforest.org. If you click on the description for the webinar that you're interested in, you'll be taken to an OSU Extension website where you can access uh, the resources that are associated with each webinar. I want to note that uh, these webinars are also being recorded and they'll be archived and accessible uh, on YouTube. And you can, again, locate those by going to the knowyourforest.org website. So if you um, know somebody who missed today's presentation, but they're interested, uh, all is not lost. And then finally, we're going to be doing some polling during the webinar. There'll be one up front. There's a couple in the middle, and then we'll have an evaluation poll at the end. And this is just an opportunity for us to learn a little bit about you and, and get some feedback as well. Um, those polls should pop up on your screen in a box, allowing you to answer the questions. And once you've done that, you can close it. If for some reason you don't see the polls, uh, take a look down at that Zoom toolbar and uh, look for a highlighted poll button. And uh, if you click on that, you should be able to get the poll to, to pop up. Okay. So that's uh, pretty much all of the housekeeping stuff. And let's go ahead and get started with the webinar. And I'll do that by introducing uh, again today's presenter, Dan Stark, who is the Extension Forester serving Clatsop, Tillamook, and Lincoln counties. And he's based in Astoria. Dan has a master's degree in wildland fire science and forest health from UC Berkeley. He's a recent 
transplant from Northern California, where he spent the last six years working as a forest health researcher, program coordinator, and educator for University of California Cooperative Extension in Humboldt and Del Norte counties. Dan's areas of interest include fire and forest health, climate change impacts on forests and forest communities, and collaborative efforts and conflict resolution around contentious forest re related issues. So Dan, if you wanna go ahead and start up your video, um, I really appreciate you uh, joining us today. Uh, I know this is a really important topic and when I think about uh, you know, my job at ODF, I see a lot of reforestation questions coming from uh, family forest landowners. So I will let you go ahead and introduce uh, your presentation before we start with the first poll. Wonderful, well, thanks Ryan. And it's just an absolute pleasure to be here on this virtual experience for tree school. Um, this is my first tree school ever and um, certainly my first tree school online. So um, thanks everyone for showing up today. Um, I'm coming to you from my home here in Seaside where the sun is just starting to come out. So I'm excited to get out and see some sunshine today after our, our, our meeting here. So go ahead and get started. So I wanted, today's talk is going to be um, really just a condensed version of a reforestation and vegetation management class that I'm going to be teaching with my colleague Alicia Christensen down in Douglas County. Um, she put a lot of this vegetation um, or this reforestation content together. We worked on it together. So I put together this reduced version for you. So um, I want to encourage everybody who's listening today to take part in OSU Extension's Master Woodland Management program. Um, I think that a lot of you probably have already taken that program and have gone through it all successfully. Um, that's going to be offered here coming up pretty soon um, in Clackamas, Benton, and the North Coast. Now this is all dependent on you know what happens with our COVID-19 restrictions. Um, Clackamas is due to come up here in, in the, uh, this coming fall, um, followed in the spring 21 in Benton, and then I hope to do it in the North Coast in the fall of 21. But stay tuned for that information. And um, I just wanted to share some um, great news for my colleague Alicia. She let us know today that um, she's at home with her husband and they've welcomed their first baby here and he's a healthy baby boy. So I just wanted to say congratulations to Alicia. Um, and with that, we'll get started with our poll. Great. That's great news. Uh, thanks, Dan. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the first poll. It should be uh, up visible on your screen now. And I will invite folks to go in there and start answering those questions. Again, this is just an opportunity for us to get to know a little bit about who's joining us today. It's starting to populate. Questions about where folks are from. They own land, they're a natural resource professional, and if they do own land, how many acres they manage. Like we're getting pretty close here. All right, well, a few more last minute answers coming in. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and close it up and I'll share those results real quick. Uh, in terms of where folks are from, uh, this is a pretty common distribution for us. Uh, about 70% of you are from the Willamette Valley, um, around 9% from Washington State. Um, got a one person from Southwest Oregon, uh, three folks from the coast, and the balance from, from around the US. We do have two people joining from outside the US. That's pretty interesting. Um, in terms of uh, who you all are, about 65% of you said you're woodland owners. 7% um, uh, said you were either a, a private natural resource professional or an agency natural resource professional. And we have quite a few woodland owners on here today. So acreage uh, is, is you know, I think an important part of this uh, conversation. And so about 25% uh, of you say you've got 10 acres or less, 33% uh, 10 to 40 acres and 13% uh, 40 to 100 acres. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that down. And Dan, I'll turn it back over to you to get, get rolling. Great. 
Thank you. So before I get started, I just wanted to let you know that, you know, being at home <laughs> is um, comes with some of its issues. So around this time, wouldn't you know, um, internet can get a little bit spotty at my house here in Seaside. So to help that, I need to turn off my video. So um, I will be lurking in the background. You will certainly be he hearing my voice and I will reappear when it's time for question and answer period. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and close off my video just to avoid any potential issues with my internet connection and then I'll get started. Okay, so regardless of your reason for owning woodland, this forest management cycle will apply to you. This is a civil cultural system, which is a planned program of treatments during the whole life of a stand designed to achieve specific stand structural objectives. As woodland owners, you will find that at any given point, you likely are engaging in multiple steps of the woodland management cycle. You may be thinning a certain patch of trees for forest health reasons. You might be pruning trees closest to your house for fire protection or planting trees in your area that is bare. And of course, putting up a good fight with scotch broom and our favorite blackberries. Here's our plan for today's presentation. What often stands in the way of successful reforestation is not a lack of effort, but simply a lack of information. Some landowners may not realize that reforestation means more than planting trees and watching them grow. The effort is seldom successful without careful planning before you plant. Also good treatment of seedlings before and during planting and careful tending of the young forest for several years after planting. The purpose of reforesting is to make sure that tree cover is maintained or reestablished after a harvest has occurred or when the stocking level is below the level specified in the Forest Practices Act for seedlings, saplings, and trees. This depends on the quality and productivity of your site or site class is what that's called. But in general in Western Oregon, which I'm gonna be talking about today, the minimum stocking is 200 trees per acre. Um, and it needs to be well distributed. In other words, not clumped. Be sure to consult with the Forest Practices Act or the Oregon Department of Forestry on this number for your particular site and in your particular area. You can also check out your site class by using the web soil survey. Any tree species, any tree species, excuse, excuse me, <laughs> having a little tongue twister today so far already. Any tree species suited to the growing site and with commercial value um, can be used for reforestation. So an approved written plan is also required if non-native species are to be used, so keep that in mind. The landowner is responsible for maintaining the stocky le stocking level, not anyone else, not the logger or not the forester. Planning for reforestation before a harvest occurs is your best bet for success. Makes compliance with these rules certainly a lot easier, that's for sure. If the Oregon Department of Forestry identifies a rule violation, the landowner will be ordered to comply with the rule and may be fined. If the land is sold, any incomplete obligation to reforest is transferred to the buyer. The seller has to notify the buyer in writing of this obligation. So how long after a harvest do I have to reforest? The reforestation compliance clock starts running when the harvest operation is completed or 12 months after felling begins, whichever comes first. Once that clock starts, landowners have 12, 12 months to start reforestation tasks such as site preparation and ordering seedlings, 24 months to complete planting, and six years to establish an adequately stocked free to grow stand that is healthy above competing vegetation and well distributed across the area. Uh, just a side note here, approved written plans are required if natural reforestation methods will be used. Plans for natural regeneration must be submitted no later than 12 months out of the completion of this operation. We're not gonna be talking about natural reforestation methods today. Um, for that, you'll have to sign up for the Greater Master Woodland uh, Manager course, um, or you can talk to your extension forester for more, more information on that. Okay, a little bit about planning here. Reforestation takes time. So prepare your plan before you harvest. 
That's about eight to 12 months before planting, which may be prior to harvest, you need to order your seedlings, arrange for a contractor to do the site preparation as needed, arrange for a contractor to plant, if, if that's um, what you, if you're gonna be hiring someone to do that planting for you. Following harvest, conduct any necessary site preparation, Plant your trees during the first winter or spring as appropriate for your area, of course, following harvest if possible. Your for reforestation choice will be the result of your woodland management goals, of course. Some of those goals for you might be timber production, wildlife, a multiple use. So you might want to balance both revenue and co commodities with non-revenue commodities, like restoring a riparian area or developing wildlife habitat, for example. One of your objecti objectives might be to create a leg legacy forest or some combination of all of the above, or even, I mean, there's many goals for your property that you can explore here. You must make decisions very early on in the process and preparation is the key to that success. Understand your site. What constraints do you have? Is it really dry? Is it wet? What's the aspect and what's the elevation? Also identify management and operational constraints. Maybe you're, maybe you're near a fish bearing stream or all your access roads happen to be dirt. There is a seasonality to when you harvest, which will dictate when you are able to plant. After you understand all of these aspects to your woodland, you are able to plan for reforestation operations. Okay, matching your seedling to your site. Matching your seedling to your site starts with surveying the seedling environment and looking for these different components here, the aspect, your slope, your elevation, the type of soils you might have, vegetation on site, the, to the topography, are there animals around, or presence of root disease. Consider the impact of all of these factors on these uh, four seedling growth requirements here, light, moisture, temperature, nutrient, oops, and the fifth one, <laughs> not all four, all five, the physical environment. So what, what can aspect and slope, elevation, et cetera, what, what do each of those have on those seedling growth requirements? That's something you have to take careful consideration of. Evaluating your site for, or your sites for suitability, um, you can consult NRCS soil maps for that. You can look for vegetation clues or vegetative clues. Where there are vegetation changes, there's usually some type of soil change. So you might have some sedges growing in wet areas or the presence of oaks in some of your more drier areas. What trees are growing there now? How's their vigor? What was there historically? Check in some other indicators as well, such as the site floor. Does it stay soggy after it rains? Is it an open to full sun or shade spot? Consider topographic features, for example, south slopes or low areas that might be frost pockets. Or known areas of disease problems, for example, root rots or even insect susceptibility issues. So we can use this information to help us tailor the best seedling biologically with the site conditions. Of course, there are other considerations, including your objectives, like profitability. However, if the seedling we plant is ill-adapted, we might not be able to meet our objectives, whatever they are, because the trees will struggle or die, and we might have to end up starting all over again. No one wants to do that. <laughs> Taking a look here, hang on, I need to get a drink of water. <clears throat> Excuse me. Different species have different tolerances to different environmental conditions. Each tree has its own set of adaptations and or tolerances to environmental stress. Trees can be subjectively ranked in their ability to tolerate various kinds of environmental stress. So as you can see here in this table, this is from the handout that I have, I made available, available for you in your resources folder, um, selecting and buying quality seedlings. 
the common uh, commercial species here is in Southwest Oregon. So <laughs> for our one participant from Southwest Oregon, this one here is for you. <laughs> um, you'll need to check out this publication for um, your, your area, of course. All have different abilities to deal with different environmental conditions. You want to observe the site before you har harvest. What species are growing best? Are there disease problems such as root rot like we discussed? Will there be a lot of shade following harvest? If you don't get to see the previous stand before you plant, look at stumps and surrounding forest to get an idea of what was there before. Always talk to your neighbor too, good idea. What, uh, what, what's been going on? And you get to talk to your neighbor. A Little bit about susceptibility to insects and disease. Um, insects and disease is an important factor to consider when selecting a species to plant. This includes immediate threats, for example, root rot pockets in the unit you're planting or long-term outbreak insect cycles. Some sites are more prone to insects and or disease. Uh, more, excuse me, some sites are more prone to insect and disease problems um, for some tree species in particular. So pictured here is a, uh, a sign actually of black stain root disease. When you see this on your Douglas fir, you know that that is black stain. That's a sign there and it's not just a Simpson. So um, thanks to OSU um, uh, pr uh, Professor Jared Lebaldis for this picture and then also for um, Brad Withrow uh, Withro, uh, Robinson from Benton County for uh, this picture here of our um, young Douglas firs, the one on the left there is really exhibiting some symptoms there of some, uh, some stress due to this black stain root disease. So it's very common for species to become adapted to the local area. This means that trees are planted in areas where they, they are not properly suited with experience. Um, uh, uh, let me start all over on that one. I'm getting all tongue tied again here. <laughs> Uh, so um, this means that trees are planted in areas where they are not properly suited, um, will experience chronic stress. So this often leads to delayed growth and uh, maybe even mortality. So it's important to plant trees that are within its range. For example, trees from lower elevations or more and more southerly latitudes tend to start growing earlier than trees from higher elevations or northerly latitudes. This increases their susceptibility to frost damage if they are planted at higher elevations or in frost pockets. It's important to plant seedlings grown from seed collected in an area where environmental conditions closely match those in your area. And it's especially important in areas such as the Cascades or Southwest Oregon where conditions can dramatically change in a short distance. Here in the old system, you can see there are 36 seed zones in Western Oregon. In the new system, there are 16 seed zones. When ordering seedlings, it's important that you order seedlings that are grown from stock that is suited to the area where it will be harvested. This includes seed zone and elevation. Is species specific? Different seed zones and elevation requirements for different species here. If you are interested in moving stock between seed zones, nurseries can insist with that protocol. In general, though, you want to avoid west to east movements in zones because drought adaptations uh, can't be affected. A good rule of thumb is that it's safe to move seedlings from north to south and from high elevations to lower ones. A little bit about seedling types. So your stock type here is equal to the number of years in the seed bed and then the number of years in your transplant bed. So for example, we have a one to one here. So that means one year is in the seed bed and one year is in your transplant bed. Some advantage and, dis and disadvantages of container stock, they're generally less expensive to purchase. Ease of planting, they're a smaller root plug and uh, generally results in better planting quality. They're easier to plant in areas of shallow or very stony soils, again, because of this small root plug. You get an extended planting season. They can be easily grown in different container sites to meet the characteristics of the planting site. Limited species available and not readily available at most nurseries here though, so keep that in mind, this limited species availability for, for our, our container stock here. Generally requires good site preparation of the planting site and follow up 
uh, tending to reduce competition. And some advantage and disadvantage of some bare root stock then here, a greater availability both in the, the variety of species and in the number of nurseries selling this type of stock. It has a larger root system that provides greater rooting depth. Again, we're talking about bare root stock here. There's less susceptibility to frost heaving or like that buildup of soils in those frost conditions. Larger than container stock, it is better suited to planting sites with higher levels of competition. Due to their large size, they are more difficult to plant versus container stock and root placement is critical for these bare root stocks. Once the seedlings are lifted from the nursery beds, they are perishable and they must be kept cool and moist until planting. And generally, bare root stock is more expensive than container stock. How do you know which stock type to plant? All this depends on planting site conditions. This is why you want to evaluate your site carefully before you plant. Depending on the limiting factors at your site, you might need to plant more than one kind of seedling. For example, if you have a lot of brush competition and don't have moisture limitation, you can go with light, larger seedlings. It's a good choice. It might be more money for you and harder to plant, but higher chance of survival and growth when competing with brush species. If your planting site is droughty or has shallow soil, you might plant smaller seedlings like plugs. In general, plant the largest tree that your site can support. Many nurseries have a limited supply of larger trees, so make sure that you order early. Okay, so you'll need to figure this out before you place your order. Uh, how many trees to plant in the spacing? We're gonna talk more on this in a bit when we get to planting. Site preparation. Adequate site prep allows your seedling to get a good start, plain and simple. Three main purpose of site preparation here. Number one, remove or suppress um, vegetation competing with your seedlings or and or to reduce fuel hazards. Two, reduce habitat for animals that browse or girdle seedlings. And three, create planting spots. Keep in mind, it's easier to plan for it before than deal with it after the trees are planted and you have vegetative or vegetation management issues. Okay. We've talked a lot about the importance of planning, describing the site conditions, matching seedlings to those site conditions, how to determine spacing, and how spacing can affect trees and stands. So I wanna pause here for a minute, and I'm gonna turn my video back on to all of you folks. And um, we're gonna open it up for some, some questions here. And um, we'll see, let's see how this goes. <laughs> here online in virtual land. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? All right, well, we yeah, we've got one. I've got I've got a couple. I've scribbled down here, but we've got one in the chat box, uh, just asking simply, uh, what kind of animals typically eat seedlings? What okay? What type of animals typically eat seedlings? We're going to be coming right up to that here in a little bit. We have a whole section coming up on uh, animal damage and what you can do to uh, minimize that risk. So hold tight. We'll talk all about that. You're on the right track. Right in the right in the right progression here. <laughs> I'll leave it in there, and if uh, we need to circle back, we will. That sounds um, good. You talked, so I, I have a couple of questions I scribbled down here. Uh, you talked a little bit, quite a bit up front, actually, about seedling availability. And I know uh, in my day job, uh, this is a question that I get asked quite a bit. It can be challenging for landowners. Um, you know, you talked about getting the right tree for the right place, which means that you can't just go to your local nursery or to Bimart or something like that and, and buy some trees. Just wondering if you have any tips, tricks, suggestions to help uh, folks get connected with seedlings. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to get into this in, in more detail, too. We're going to talk about when you need to add, order those seedlings and, and how you can go about do it, doing it and some resources for doing that. So um, Forest Seedlings Network is a great resource for you. Um, checking out um, um, where you can find these seedlings. 
you can do all kinds of great things there, like even hire contractors. And all you have to do is enter the region um, that you're at, and um, and there'll be some other um, uh, features that you can click off there, um, and it will bring up some ideal things, uh, seedlings for you. Um, we're going to get into that in a little bit more depth. So um, hold tight. I also want to just put a you know a plug out there for, our, and I'll mention this again too. Um, work closely with your neighbors, and your, the and in particular the small um, woodland owners association. Um, I didn't get a chance to plug that here in the beginning here, but it sounds like we have a lot of woodland owners here, and I really hope that uh, uh, you all are members of the of Oswa. Um, there's the plant sales um, they offer every year, and um, typically in early in the spring in February or so. But you need to check with your local chapter um, in your county to find out when those plant sales are. Um, so those might be a good option for you if you want fewer seedlings, for example. But you can also order a lot of seedlings um, if you need to. So um, we'll go over that again. So uh, hold tight, and hopefully we'll uh, answer that question. And if not, we'll pick it up again and, and make sure you get that right answer. Okay. We've had a few more questions uh, come in here to the to the box, so I'll ask those. Uh, uh, let's see. The first one is uh, just thinking about uh, vegetation control, which is something you started going into. Asking if it's if it, is it better to you know complete to do that across the entire unit, across the entire site where you're planting, or could you just do some spot clearing around the areas where you're planting trees? Uh, yes. <laughs> so you want to treat as much vegetation um, as you can. So we have a whole session here or section coming up on vegetation management. Um, we're going to go into that in depthly. So the thing you want to remember is you want to do it early on and you want to do it as thorough as you possibly can because you're just going to get problems later on if you don't. So and also you're going to be anticipating some regrowth after, you know, a couple of years, too. So the more you can control early on, the better off you're going to be. And um, we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll talk um, more deeply about this coming up here. And there's another kind of related question, you know, sort of uh, what about existing native vegetation and how do you how do you handle that uh, in terms of, you know, whether you're doing a broadcast treatment or a more targeted treatment? Right. Well, I mean, it, if it's veg, if it's if it's um, native vegetation or not, I mean, if you um, you want to work with nature as best as you can, so you're going to be working with a lot of that native uh, that vegetation. So that can still compete with your seedlings if it's if it's native or not. So um, take that into account. You don't want anything that's going to overtop your seedlings or that's going to be competing with available water, available light, any of those things that are required for those seedlings to grow. Um, so I understand, you know, the probably the caution, you know, you want to preserve as much native vegetation as you can and and you know you will be and just remember that you're going to be creating some habitat there with your seedlings that can favor that native that vegetation so um, be mindful just you know native or not that it has the ability to compete with your seedlings and you want to minimize that as best as possible and another uh, i think related question to that is is talking about interplanting so uh, it sounds like a site uh, that uh, maybe was was reforested and then uh, some of those trees failed and uh, there's now some more competition coming in and is it okay to then come into that site and clear out some of that competition and then interplant with younger uh, seedlings? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just full disclosure here, uh, my background is in forest health. And um, so these um, really in-depth um, questions on reforestation, I would love to um, throw you all in a room and let you talk to each other about this, because I think you get some of the best help and input you can possibly get from your own neighbors um, and from people who um, are also woodland owners, and they can kind of help you with this and give you some input and share some feedback with what works best for them. Um, so um, absolutely, you can do that. Um, I would check with some some um, some of your neighbors uh, to start with here and also you know we can talk about this more offline with your extension foresters who can help you work through this and work a plan together if that should happen to you so I mean you do not want that to, to happen, you know, something to go wrong and then you have to come back and, and do it again. But you know, things happen and this is a forest and you know, things are changing all the time there. So I think the more you can anticipate that and kind of um, deal with things up front, the better off you'll, you'll, you, you'll be. But you know, things happen and sometimes you have to just, you know, reassess and, and kind of deal with those pockets that you might have and, and try replanting in those areas. Or you might decide that you have to plant somewhere else if you're not having success in that spot. You might have to consider, you know, um, why those seedlings might not be successful there. And so an extension forester um, and others can help you kind of um, problematize that and work for towards some solutions. 
<laughs> Long-winded well, response. Gonna <laughs> that's good. I'm going to continue right on down this theme. Uh, lots, there's lots of questions about competition here. Uh, the next one is is asking about kind of the minimum area that should be maintained around a seedling uh, to, to help it be as successful as possible. Yeah, it, it, that really just all depends on your spacing, how many seedlings you have on your site. You know, just think about something being there and competing with your available resources. So um, we'll go over some tips um, in this next section here when we go through the specifics of planting. Um, I'll talk about where you want to plant and, and areas that you want to avoid planting. Um, and then you could um, kind of see how there's just, it really is nuanced in what you need to do. It just really all depends on your site and where you're planting um, and, and how you're planting. And I just also want to bring in all of this here too, just really quick. Um, OSU Extension, I think a lot of you probably know this, has just tons of, of, of um, resources available for you. So, you know, I put some information for you in your resources. I just want to encourage you to check those publications too. And um, there's a lot of good information published there that can help you work out through some of these issues as well. Two more questions, quick ones, I think, and then we probably better get back to the presentation and we'll return yeah. to the, at the end here. Yeah. Um, a couple, couple of folks asking, what do you mean when you refer to aspect? Oh, aspect. Okay, that's just, oh, thank you for, for bringing up that question. Aspect is just the direction that you're facing on your property, right? So you can be, um, you could have a, a north aspect or a, a south aspect and um, just so the direction that, that your property is mostly facing. So I'm um, here in Seaside, you know, I, I'm here um, on this, um, I'm south facing <laughs> and um, so that's my aspect so I get a lot of um, kind of warmer sunshine here um, starting in the morning when the sun rises up here on the east and I get full sun all day long because of um, that position that my house is sitting there so um, just where you where you what 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 um, aspect your your slope might be on or, or your property might be on can make all the difference in terms of temperature and those things we talked about light and and those things can be impacted by those so um, carefully look at some of those components there that we talked about on your site when you're doing that pre-site assessment and think about them carefully and thoughtfully and how they um, will impact or might impact those growth requirements of your seedlings. And one last one, when's the best time to, to plant? Aha, okay, we're gonna talk about that too. So um, early spring is, is when we're gonna start here, but that depends too. Um, and um, it depends on your area. Um, if you're in an area, um, um, you might need to start planting before the snow um, starts falling. So we're gonna get into all these great questions. You guys are all on the right track. You're starting to think about these things that we're gonna talk here in a minute. So um, hopefully we can answer in more detail some of those questions you all had here in our next section. And um, and again, just a reminder, we have plenty of time at the end here for uh, more questions. Great. I'll let you get back to it and uh, keep the questions coming into the Q&A box. Please do. Thank you. Those were all outstanding questions. Yeah, thank you. And um, I'm going to go back into Zoom land again, and I'm going to disappear. <laughs> so see you, see you here um, when we come back again. Okay. Just make sure I turned off my video and not my sound. We're all good. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so we're going to shift gears a little bit here and talk about vegetation competition because it's one of the most important limitations to reforestation success, as a lot of you were kind of already kind of hanging out here with some of your questions. Sites can have mostly one or the other of these forms of competing vegetation or both. Vegetation management means weed and brush control. If you don't control the competing vegetation, your trees will be shaded out and will not grow as fast. They may even die if the competition is too severe, and hopefully that won't happen to you. Competing vegetation will hog all the resources like water, nutrients, and sunlight and growing space, making it hard to impossible for seedlings to grow. You can do veg management manually by clearing veg around each tree seedling. Most often it is accomplished with herbicides. 
For questions on herbicides, I'm going to refer you to the Pacific Northwest Weed Management Handbook. I, I, uh, there's a link for that um, publication. It's actually a book, um, and that's in your resources folder. And um, if you're a small woodland owner, you probably already have this reference, this resource. And if you don't, you should consider getting one, checking one out the library, or maybe going in with your neighbors and buying a copy that you can all share because it's really valuable to have, and there's some, a lot of great um, information in there for you. Um, so. So um, we've talked a little bit here about some of the questions that were brought up about um, how to manage here in these spaces. So we'll continue here more on that on that um, theme here. Okay, before proceeding with any of these methods, it's best to, best to have a clear understanding of the type of competition to be reduced. Shrub, shrubs, grasses, and herbs all have different reproductive strategies some of which may be favored by improper site preparation. You don't want to favor <laughs> um, those kind of um, competing vegetation here. The option you select depends on the condition of the site, so the type of vegetation present, the soil type, the slope, again, that aspect, that direction that your property is facing in animals, and your objectives, constraints, and resources. Okay, and we're already time for another poll here. I want to hear about uh, what kind of management practices that you all um, have used and um, what works best for you. And um, let me turn my video back on just so you can see me during this part. Uh, did you miss me? <laughs> I'm back. And um, so let's take a moment to take out this poll here. And um, this is one of those questions here, Ryan, sorry if I'm stomping on your territory here, but um, there's an option for other. And um, you know, if you don't see what's worked well for here, um, for you here, um, you could utilize that chat box and, and, and put there what, you know, that other method that you think works best for you. Okay, take it away, Ryan. <laughs> No, that was great. I think uh, answers are coming in. Uh, the choices that we've got on here are chemical, mechanical, broadcast burn, or prescribed fire. And then uh, a couple folks are starting to click on other. We'll see if anybody shares anything in the chat box. Okay. Right now, it looks like uh, mechanical treatments are are uh, winning the day here. About 70, 75% of folks saying that they're using mechanical treatments around, um, oh, this is one that allows um, more than one answer. Okay, I was, I was just thinking That's to myself, right. geez, those aren't adding up to 100%. So. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like most folks are doing a combination of chemical and mechanical uh, with a lot of people engaged in, in mechanical treatments. Uh, a little bit of use of fire, not too much. And um, when I look down here in the chat, I'm seeing hands, so, you know, we would probably call that mechanical removal, even if you're doing it by hand. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so. <laughs> Great. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. And Great. Yeah. And clearing manually around the trees and, 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 um, and time them. Oh, and then time them. I'm not sure what that means, but yeah, you can get in there and, and do that manually. So um, what a labor of love that is, right? You all just work so hard for your property and um, put in some blood, sweat, and tears in all of your work. Um, and, uh, that's kind of what it takes, doesn't it? <laughs> you all know that more than I do. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to go off screen here again, and we'll continue with our presentation. Okay, so here are some various methods here just to show you a kind of what can be done here. So hand application. Here's someone using a backpack sprayer. Um, aerial application, you know, this, you need to have large acreage for this, or you can team up with another landowner. This isn't something obviously you're going to be doing for a small site. For your tractor and blush, brush blades, choose your operator carefully. You want to minimize compaction as best as possible. So avoid oversized equipment and don't, don't operate on wet soil. So for compaction reasons and also for the spread of forest pathogens, you don't wanna be moving stuff around in those wet soils if you can at all um, uh, prevent it. Don't overdo it. Don't try and build a parking lot. There's such a thing as too much of a good thing. Large broadcast fires are not common due to air quality concern. It was really great to hear that there are a couple people here on, at the talk that have tried some kind of form of, of prescribed fire. I'd love to hear more about that and where you're doing that and how it worked for you. 
Uh, recognize the importance of slash to site productivity is encouraging more landowners to leave it to rot, actually. Liability concerns of large fires and required personnel make this an expensive option for small, small woodland owners. Um, just wanted to um, uh, bring up here that um, a lot of you may have heard, some of you may not have heard that Oregon State um, Extension Forest and Natural Resources has a new fire program. So we're getting extension agents across uh, the state of Oregon. We have a statewide fire specialist and we're gonna have people out in your region and in your counties out there to help you with questions and concerns related to fire. So hold tight for that. We're all really excited for that to happen. So um, prescribed fire is something that I really love and um, where it makes sense to do so, it's a great tool if you can do it. Um, it's not always feasible for a lot of reasons, but anyway, I'm getting sidetracked here and we got to keep on track. Okay. <laughs> um, burning slash piles is much more manageable and can be done with a permit by a small woodland owner. So that's a little bit more practical for that small wood owner. Combinations are often used. So spray and burn. Sprays kill the root systems to minimize sprouting after the burn. You can brown and burn, used where there is well-developed live woody brush and not much fuel to carry a fire. The brush is sprayed, allowed to cure, and then burned. And you can just pile and burn. So that's the most common here. So um, those combos are, are a pretty popular thing. Okay, moving on to ordering, transporting, and storing your seedlings. Got this nice picture of this seedling here from uh, Warehouser on their online site. So just wanted to acknowledge that. Okay, searching for seedling availability with these um, directories here. Uh, just a handful of them. Um, and again, just a, a, a reminder here and a plug for Oswa, your county small woodlands owner association also have seedling sales. So connect with your neighbors and um, talk to them about what you can plant and um, check out these, these seedling sales. Um, pretty fun stuff. I got to help out with some down in Lincoln County and in my area and it was just a fun time. and. Tons of people come to them and you know more than just trees are sold and depending on your area and it's a good way to get out and, and see people in your community as well. Um, socially distancing, of course, I think <laughs> will be okay hopefully by next year. <laughs> um, but um, good, play, good place to, uh, to, to mingle as well. Uh, most reforestation in Western Oregon is done December through March. So when soil moisture is in abundant, when seedlings are dormant and less sensitive to lifting and handling stress, uh, east side sites and higher elevation sites might be planted in fall or spring. This was kind of a question that we talked about earlier here um, because of snow excess, but be very um, careful about that. You want to order your seedlings about, about 12 months ahead of time. And um, keep in mind that most nurseries will require a deposit. Seedlings are often sold in units of a thousand trees, but sometimes you can get in units of a hundred. So you need to check around and find out where, where you can get those seedlings if you want lower amount. If you contract with a nursery, you need to order about 5,000 5, plus seedlings. Okay, picking up your order. Now, as tempting as it might be to go out and grab the biggest seedling that you could possibly find because you want that to grow and produce shade for your family, it's just not always practical, right? Ha ha ha, this is a little mid-afternoon humor for you. Um, this is not a seedling, obviously. This is a Colorado blue spruce that's being hauled into uh, the Durham Museum um, for their Christmas tree that year. So um, probably something that's gonna be a little bit more practical for you um, might be something like this. <laughs> Um, check your, the bags and the seedlings when you pick up your order. For every single bag, um, as they load it into your truck, you know, just um, as they're loading your truck, check those bags. Make sure there are no holes in the bag and that the bags are labeled. Seedlings should be moist and they should have been stored in the cold storage. There can be a small amount of white mold on those fine roots and that's okay. Those are likely a mycorrhizal fungi, and those fungi help um, the seedlings because they help them become established, established once they're in the field. Gray moldy seedlings, however, um, are a sign of improper storage, so you want to avoid those. Keep in mind you're allowed to deny seedlings if they're moldy, if the bags are torn, if they're full of mud, and so on. 
So be an active member when you're picking up those seedlings. Make sure you inspect those seedlings careful. This is the future of your forest here. And so make sure you, you have some viable seedlings from the get-go. You want to plan as soon as you can after you get your seedlings. You don't want to let them sit around outside of the cooler or the nurseries for too long. That just increases their chance of mortality through exposure. Okay, so for planting, how many? What's the required spacing? It doesn't have to be a square. You, need, you can follow your site first. So a tighter crowded understory will require more thinning. So keep that in mind. Where a wider spacing is gonna require more maintenance because you're gonna have more competing vegetation coming in there, uh, but it's gonna result in fewer thinnings. This depends on your resources and your objectives. 10 by 10 and 12 by 10 spacings, however, are the most popular. One of the most common questions you'll hear is how many trees should I plant? And the typical response, it depends. You'll need to know what's out there already. Is it evenly distributed or clumpy? Does it need some sort of survey of situation for determining stocking needs? Expect, expected mortality can be estimated from things like historical experiences on similar sites. So how intense the site prep will be, et cetera. You'll need to know you, your owner objectives will influence that. Will you be just be meeting the forest protection requirements or will you be maximizing wood production? Just keep in mind that better sites, um, it will equal more trees. A little bit about pre-commercial pre thinning. So close spacing reduces time to uh, your pre-commercial thinning where wide spacing is gonna increase that time. The more trees closely that you have together, the quicker that you're gonna have to pre-commercial thin, in other words. So where to plant? You wanna choose an area with mineral soil exposed. That's away from animal holes and game trails, especially elk trails, right? away from concentrations of re-sprouting brush. And you want to plant an area that's protected in, sh in a shaded area next to a trump or, or a, a stump or a log, for example. Planting is a long-term decision. It's best to do it right the first time. <laughs> of course, we all want to do it right the first time. And you just want to make sure you can do all you can and you're crossing all of those boxes off to make sure you're, you're getting it right the first time. You might want to make sure that you're taking climatic variables into account. On wet sites, if you have wet sites you're going to be planting on, don't plant in depressions. Plant up on the small rises um, in a, on the convex slopes. On your hotter sites, you want to plant in the shade. Um, you, um, uh, or you can um, even plant near slash of that area to help keep those root collars a little bit cooler. Don't get too hung up on staying on a 12 by 12 grid like we talked about. Take advantage of the microclimates that might be on your site, like the shade side of a stump, for example. Remember, a tree is lo a long-lived organism that will stay in the same location its entire life, so choose your site carefully. The choice of a planting site and proper planning are long-term decisions that you're gonna be making. Don't leave your seedlings out in the sun. Don't leave your seedling roots exposed. Probably going to want to grab yourself a planting bag if you're the one, if you're not hiring a contractor to do this, um, just for ease of planning, keeping those all there on your back. And of course, you're going to need some tools of the trade for your planting experience. So um, using special shovels and planting hoes um, are, are recommended. So those are called hoe dads. Typically, regular shovels will not last, but there are some exceptions here for use of those. Get the tool that fits your seedling and your abilities. Um, um, it's you that's going to be doing it if you're the one that's going to be doing it. So choose it, choose it accordingly. There are many types of, of shovels and hoes in existence. So get one large enough to get your seedling roots in the ground without that J or L rooting the seedling. And we're going to talk about what that means in a second here.
Shovels work best for large stock and are easiest for planters um, lacking upper body strength or those who have lower back problems. Um, and they almost always give a vertical planting hole. Garden shovels will eventually break on large planting jobs. So they're not really suited, suited for this um, kind of workload here. Hoes can plant at a faster rate and the hoe can be used sideways to clear a planting spot too. So keep that in mind. Many planters prefer a hoe with a 100 degree handle bracket instead of a 90 degree bracket to um, minimize stooping over. So where can you buy these types of tools and supplies? Um, you can buy them online at the Pacific Forestry Supply, Terra Tech. There's forestry suppliers or Ben Meadows. Um, you probably all have your local um, favorite spot where you want to go and get your tools too. So check out your local saw shop or your local farm supply. Um, like I said, you might have some other places that you like to go and get your tools. Okay, folks. It's the moment you all have been waiting for. The drum roll. How to plant a tree. <clears throat> Excuse me. How to plant a tree. Prepare the site by clearing snow, bark, limbs, and other debris from around the planting spot. Dig the planting hole as shown. Remove the seedlings from your bad or, or bag or bucket one at a time. Then you're going to plant your seedlings straight with no air pockets. Easy peasy, right? <laughs> a little bit more complicated than that. <laughs> it's hard not to plant correctly, but it's really easy to plant wrong. So here's just some um, different mistakes or commonly um, uh, occurring some planting mistakes here that you want to avoid. And we'll talk about these here a little bit more um, like these J um, or stuffed, the J root or stuffed kind of um, um, problem here. So these both died after a few years in the ground because of poor root development. So that's something you don't want to happen. So take that time early on to make sure that you're planting those carefully and straight in here, um, that, that you have the right tool. Good rule of thumb, green side up, brown side down. How this happens makes all the difference. We've just covered transportation storage, planting tools, proper planting techniques. Many trees are planted dead because of poor handling. Okay, four common causes of planting failure. Number one, unsuitable or poor quality planting stock. Again, make sure you have the right seedling for the right site. Number two, improper handling and storage. We've gone over some tips briefly um, here about how you could um, handle your seedlings properly and store them properly. Number three, animal damage. We're gonna talk about that here in a minute. And then lastly, number four, competition for water and light by surrounding vegetation, right? So um, uh, for whatever reason, not um, getting that site prep and that vegetation management taken care of early on, early on. We're ready for another poll already. I'm curious about the right. types of uh, pests that you all experience here. So again, you'll have an option to choose more than one. And if you have a pest that's not listed, you could put that in the chat room. Chat box. <laughs> and this relates back to a question that we had earlier about uh, what kind of animals eat trees. So here's a few listed right here on the poll and That's maybe right. some folks will share a few others. That's right. So what are the critters that give you the most grief? So we have deer here and elk, gophers or voles, rabbits, mountain beaver, depending on where you live. And there, there could be others and there probably are others. So if you have some of those, um, oh, horses. Wow. Okay. Yeah, uh, talking about uh, seedling availability and working with nurseries, uh, I uh, helped with an order of uh, trees for some landowners that were impacted by a wildfire. And uh, at some point, the trees that we ordered in the nursery, uh, the some deer got in there and browsed them out and set the whole thing back. They had to start from scratch and and put us back about a year. So <laughs> it happens even to the to the professionals. 
They're so cute, though, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll, and okay. we can share out the results there. Wonderful. It looks so like deer and gophers and voles are the clear winners with uh, rabbits and mountain beaver uh, following behind. I'm surprised people didn't mark elk more. That's definitely, I think, on the north coast in particular, probably pretty common. Right. Yeah, we, we had uh, Yeah, down in the chat. Go ahead. I was going to say down in the chat, we just have horses and cattle there. All right, horses and cattle. Okay, well, we're going to talk about these in a bit. Yeah, here in Seaside, I get to see the uh, one of the herds of elk quite often, and um, Seaside High School is right near my house, and they love hanging out on the football field there. It's just kind of weird to be going by there in the morning, just like, whoop, there's a bunch of elk. So, yeah, they like to, to go up into Gearhart here and cause a lot of problems and up into the hills. <laughs> Again, beautiful creatures, can't be very big pests. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you everybody for that poll and that information. Okay, so here we have some animal protection options for you. Sometimes animals can affect tree survival, growth, and the form of seedlings, the form that they're gonna take as they grow. The seedlings can die outright by overbrowsing from deer and elk or from clipping caused by various rodents. So clipping off those, uh, your branches here. Um, uh, if you have some um, big leaf maple, this used to happen a lot down in, in Northern California. We would see branches that just started dying of the big leaf maple and it, we thought there might be a pathogen or something that's causing that problem, squirrels. So that clipping is a very real thing and, and, and can affect your, your plantings here. So that would happen to be on a, a big leaf maple. It's important to recognize and anticipate animal damage so you can take the appropriate action to limit your loss beforehand. So there's some protective um, devices that are available for this, like Vexar tubes. So we're looking up from the bottom to the top. Oh, I guess we're looking down on that seedling here in a Vexar tube. Um, kind of a really neat photo here. Um, these Vexar tubes are placed over the seedlings and attached to a stake with twi twist ties. Um, the good news about these is they photo decay after about five years. The bad news I've heard from a, some of my landowners is that elk kind of don't care and they will come and dig them up anyway. So, um, you know, um, good luck with that if you're, if you're dealing with elk and um, they, they can be uh, pesky critters there. Don't give up though. <laughs> Stay at it. Um, there are some repellents available for you. They smell like rotten eggs. <laughs> um, so, um, um, you want that probably to be further away from your house if possible. Um, you can apply them to the leader of the seedlings to deter browsing. They're cheaper than using Vexar tubing, but needs to be reapplied annually for a few years until the seedlings are big enough to defend themselves. So um, you're gonna have to reapply those every year. Um, some direct action you can take that could be in the form of trapping or baiting. And those are, that's really effective for rodents like goats or mountain beaver and, and rabbits there. Your choice for animal control will be determined by your, the cost and availability, the labor to apply and then monitor and remove um, those things, um, the access to the site, the type of browsing in the animal, the size of the seedling during the susceptible storage, and whether or not you have wind or if there's snow accumulation on your site. Okay. Oh, I didn't mean to put that one on there. Okay. So a little bit, a little note here on um, release treatments. Um, vegetation control after trees have been planted because competition for sun, moisture, and um, nutrients often depresses the vigor and survival of planted desired trees. So it's done before the seedlings become overtopped by competing vegetation. So why release? The reforestation requirement is that the trees be free to grow by the sixth growing season following harvest. Just because you prepared your site before you planted trees doesn't mean that there still won't be competition. Within one to two years, you will see brush and other plants start to compete with your seedlings like you can see here in the photo. I don't know if you noticed that, if you can even see those seedlings popping out there, those red arrows are pointing those out. So you can see how that competing vegetation there, and that looks like um, native vegetation growing in there, um, competing and about to overtop those seedlings there. Early intervention is the best. Don't let things get out of control. Down the road, um, 
uh, release treatments allows you to shorten your harvest rotation and enables you to thin earlier if these are woodland management goals of yours, of course. In the end, it increases growth and survival of your seedlings, increases growth and survival of your seedlings here. Okay, so reforestation surveys. The, the main point here is that you're gonna to wanna to have some sort of follow-up evaluation or monitoring after planting. And that needs to be done to catch problems such as animal damage and competition from vegetation and just for, for survival. Usually a survey should be done at least at the end of the first year. For a woodland owner, an annual evaluation for the first several years seems pretty useful um, from the information that we've been um, hearing. And you need to cover the ground. Make sure you cover as, uh, you know, that whole area as best as you can into your ability. A systemic sample is helpful when there are questions about survival. So if you use a systemic sample, the plot size and number of plots will be a function of variability and how um, confident you want to be with the result. So what I mean by a systemic sample is, you know, putting in these plots across your property and then monitoring those plots um, or those sites that you have um, repeatedly over time. So that's, that's a systemic sampling approach. We also, Oregon State Extension has a lot of inventory publications, so uh, oops, make sure that you check those um, for more information. Uh, some helpful resource, uh, re uh, reforestation um, planning sheets that I made available for you in your resources um, uh, folder. Um, one is a reforestation prescription form. This one outlines the basic details for planning reforestation activities specifically suited to your needs and management goals. There's another one there, it's a reforestation assessment form. Um, these questions are more in depth for understanding the current status challenges for successful reforestation on your woodland. So have a look at those and those are available for use for you and um, um, you'll find them quite useful for, um, for your property and your reforestation assessments. Okay, folks, we made it almost to the end here. Just remember to plan ahead. You wanna match your species to your site, anticipate your vegetation problems before you harvest. You wanna order your seedlings 12 months plus in advance, a year in advance or more. Make sure you prepare your site properly. We talked about handling your seedlings property and monitoring competing vegetation and using those release treatments as needed. And just a, uh, just a suggestion here um, uh, to learn your Oregon forest practice rules. And um, you may know, and I had on the first slide there, um, Ofri has a really good illustrated guide for that. And I keep some on my desk um, and always consult those. And I have some available um, for people who might come in um, and to talk to me about this. So visit your local extension forester and they might have one there for you as well. And that's it, folks. We're going to wrap it up here and then take some more questions. We're done a little bit early, so that will give us some time um, to have some more um, uh, questions here. Let me turn my, my video back on. <laughs> there we go, off and on. Okay, any questions? So, and thank you, we've everyone. Got, we've got some in, well, thank, thank you, Dan. And we've, we've got some questions in the box, but first I have to ask, is there a story behind this, this great <laughs> picture on your slide? Well, I wish that I, I had more of a, of, of a new, um, more detail who they were. This was um, a, a slide that my, my colleague, Alicia Christensen, put up here. And um, I have a hunch that this is some of her family here. So um, um, most likely down in Southwestern Oregon um, and folks back in the 70s here out there with their, their planting tools. And you can see they have their planting bags there and um, out there reforesting that lovely sight looking at those beautiful snow-capped mountains there across the valley. I'll have to check in with Alicia yeah. and, uh, and uh, find out the specifics of who's actually in this picture. Well, it's, it's a great picture. It's a good one to have on there. Yeah. So uh, let's see, looking at the questions in the box here, uh, winding back uh, kind of towards the beginning of your presentation, you were talking about seed zones and getting the right tree for the right place. Um, and there's a couple of questions uh, related to climate change and um, wanted to make sure that, you know, we, we heard you right in talking about it, that it's okay to move 
trees from seed zones kind of from south to north, uh, but not the other way around. Is that is that right? Well, if you're moving something for, that's the general flow. So, you know, you don't want to move a tree that's in some, something that has, um, you know, that's these higher elevations or, or a cooler elevation, and then you're moving them to those warmer elevations. So, yeah, typically that's from that north to south movement. So moving them into a more, you know, something that's at higher elevations, have cooler temperatures um, and, and um, uh, different moisture requirements um, than something that would be planted in more of those warmer zones. Yeah. And what, uh, oh, did you have more there? Oh, that's all I had to say about that. I don't know if you wanted me to talk about that climate change uh, connection with this right now, or, or, or if you have a question to ask for that. Um, well, you, you could, and, and actually maybe the next question kind of relates to that, just sort of what do you do if you can't find trees for, the, you know, for your zone, the, exactly the right thing? Oh, well, um, I don't know of a situation where you can't find the right tree for your zone. Um, unless you happen to be in an area where there aren't trees. <laughs> so um, I would you know, um, I would refer you to that forest seedling network guide and um, kind of see what's available in your local area and um, talk to your extension forest of what, foresters of what you can plant in your area. Um, and I'd be curious to know a little bit more about that and, and where that question's coming from and, um, and where what that has to do with changing climate or, or, or what um, site conditions. Um, I, I would need a little bit more um, 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 information about that. Yeah, and I guess, uh, you know, I'm thinking that the Department of Forestry does have a seed bank uh, that has a, a pretty good reserve of, of seed for most of the seed zones represented in Oregon. And we help often landowners with uh, restoration after wildfire. And there really have only been a couple of cases, rare cases, sort of in, at higher elevations, primarily in eastern or northeastern Oregon, where maybe it's been difficult to find seed. Um, but generally, once you start asking around through ODF or through the Forest Service, uh, we're able to find find seed. Okay, okay. That's in my experience anyway. So Great. thank you for that. And, and thanks for chiming in. So um, um, thank you for that for that uh, personal um, expertise. <laughs> and did you did you want to say anything else about climate change? Okay, with respect well, to climate change. Okay, so changing climates. Um, that that's a this is something that um, we are currently faced with, right? So um, we get a lot of questions. Um, I'm new to this job. I'm rounding out my 10th month here in Oregon, and I can't tell you just how common of a question this is. You know, should I be planting something different in my area to allow for changing climates in the future? Um, and you know, there's, there's a lot of, of information there and, and a, a lot to consider. Um, so someone like me who has a forest health background, um, I'm a little bit more cautious about starting to move some of our species around. Um, you can move common species that occur throughout Oregon, but you might move a species um, from one area to another and you might you might start a, there might be a, a novel pest interaction there that you, that hasn't occurred previously. So something about that tree moving to a different site and away from, for example, like if it's um, um, a tree that's susceptible to bark beetles and um, you know, it, it might be, um, you know, something completely new might happen in, in this new site. So, um, so that's kind of um, also, um, uh, I think about pathogens too. So moving something to a new area um, and just what those new conditions might mean for that tree species there. We don't have a lot of research available right that, about this right now. So there is work that's being done on this. So there's uh, some extensive work um, and some research being done where people are looking at, at seeds and seedlings from different areas and planting them in new areas and you know um, taking data on that to see how they function and to see how well they perform. So um, you know this is um this is just one of those those kind of topics that it for me i just have to say it really all depends so on that we also get a lot of questions about people wanting to grow redwoods up here in oregon so um you know as species as climate continues to change and um that um tree species we there are two sequoia species giant sequoia and, and then of course coastal redwood um that grow here and uh, well historically in oregon we had some redwood in the southern part um but you know so northern california is is, is their their range right now but you know um will that be the same in the future so um there might be people on this this uh, presentation day who are growing redwoods on their property um and i'd really like to talk to you if if, if you are a, a, a 
landowner who's growing redwoods, um, please reach out to me. I'd like to talk to you. Um, we're putting together some information um, and some um, for for folks like you all and who are curious about this about redwoods and um, you know are they viable to plant here? Um, redwoods typically are known as a, a more tolerant of, of pests and diseases. There's you know, a lot of people think, and you hear this often, that they're free from pests and disease, and they actually are not. So um, when they are stressed, they do have a beetle that will, um, um, can kill them if they're small enough in diameter, they take out small branches. Um, and just, um, um, so that's something we need to be careful about. So, um, boy, that's a long-winded kind of roundabout way of saying it all depends. So um, uh, we have a lot more research to um, conduct on this, but um, I understand people want to get going on this. So um, if this is something that you're, you're planning and um, you want to plant some other um, different species on your site, I would say work closely with your extension foresters and um, you know, you want to make sure you're doing the right thing for your site. So it still applies. Is it the right seedling for the right site? So <clears throat> you'll need to consider all those things we've gone over for, for that. Um, and keep in mind that pest, um, future pest um, issue. Um, and, and that could be an insect pest or, or a disease pest as well. Okay. <laughs> well, it seems like an, seems like an easy topic, but oh, always... Yeah. Uh, Always more nuanced, and, and it depends is a very common answer, I think, in, in yeah. most disciplines. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, pivot to a few different questions here. Uh, we've got some more uh, just related to vegetation control, kind of coming back to that topic. Um, one person just asking, uh, you know, if it really is possible to effectively manage competing vegetation mechanically. Uh, recognizing, of course, yes, that's a lot of work, but you know, is, is it is it really possible to do that? Uh, not use any herbicides. Well, I would love to toss that that question out to you all who've tried this before, and um, I, it, it depends, right? So, I mean, it, it depends on how much vegetation you have on your site, that the site, the, um, the how many acres you're doing, you know, and um, um, and just the timing of it all, and and what was there previously. So um, I would really like to, you know, ask the group that and hear, you know, um, we're not we don't have that chat capability, but you know, has that worked for you? Um, just um, using um, pure manual, and we had some people who responded in our. Um, in our chat box from early on that said that's what they use and they, they actually um, just do some things by hand. Um, so um, it's going to be tricky. Um, like I said, this isn't my area of expertise at all. So from what I've been reading from our references and from what I've heard from my colleagues is that, and, and I mentioned this in the slide too, um, it, it typically can be a combination of both of those that can be effective, but that all really depends on your site and your objectives and um, when and when you control that vegetation, what was there beforehand. Refer to our publications too for that, for some more in-depth um, um, readings on that, um, taking care of plan, uh, planting your seedlings um, and, and follow that through. I'm gonna go ahead and throw up um, our uh, ending wrap up poll and I'm just going to put that up on the screen to allow everyone to provide a little bit of feedback on this presentation and we'll just uh, collect that while we continue to answer some questions. Um, Dan, I might also have you advance your slideshow here uh, real quick just to, to remind folks that um, Tree School Online will of course be back next Tuesday. Uh, June 2nd, we'll have a morning session at 10 and an afternoon session at 3. The morning session will focus on carbon sequestration for family forest landowners. And then if you join in the afternoon, you'll see me along with Lauren Grant, and we're going to talk about management planning. Um, and again, uh, you can register for those at knowyourforest.org. Uh, they are just like this presentation, all uh, free of charge, uh, but registration is required. And we will continue to answer questions here until hopefully we get through all of them. And I'll leave that poll up. Um, so another question that's come up uh, here, Dan, a couple of times is uh, if you could just talk a little bit more about what you mean when you talk about a release treatment and maybe give some examples. A release treatment. Okay. Well, I won't go back to that slide. So a release treatment is... Um, Okay, so when you have your, we talked about planting seedlings. I kind of want to go back to my slide here, but I don't want to get to um, to lose this site here. So your trees, your your seedlings are going to start. Um, um, 
compacting and growing together, depending on how tightly you plant those seedlings, right? So as they grow up together, think about when you plant a bunch of, um, if you're a gardener and you plant a bunch of, a very different here, but think about um, you're going to be planting some lettuces, for example. You put out your seed, okay, we're not starting from seedlings here, but um, those seed, those Lettuces sprout and grow, and they're usually clumped together. Now, you can leave those all clumped until the end, right, and then harvest your lettuce, but you're not going to get that many, um, uh, you know, full-size lettuces at the end. You're going to have a lot of problems with crowding with your resources there, and they're going to compete with each other. You're going to start seeing a lot of um, some of your lettuces kind of getting droopy and, and brown, and they're going to start, um, you know, falling off where some of them might become more vigorous. So what I do as a lettuce gardener when I'm growing lettuce is I go through and I pick out some of those um, lettuces that are competing with some of those nicer looking lettuces, future lettuce heads, um, that I want to grow to the end there. So think about that as that pre-commercial thin, right? Your, your seedlings are growing together. You want to go through and assess your site and um, look for those seedlings that are doing well, that are growing. Um, uh, um, um, they might be growing better than some of the others, or they might not be. And to, to, um, choose those seedlings, or, you know, this could be helpful if you have someone else um, helping you with this, a um, consulting forester, for example, who can do this, and or your neighbors who might have done this, um, and, and um, they'll come in and thin that, um, that, um, that release treatment then. So by thinning those out, you're releasing those trees that are left behind to grow. They're, they now have more access to those resources that those other seedlings were, may have been hogging, um, like light and, and water and moisture and that kind of thing. So you get this release treatment um, there. And, and um, so th that, that's what I mean, like coming in and doing something that's going to, if, especially if you have a bunch of trees uh, or your seedlings kind of closer together, you you might need to come in and thin those out and then that will release that those seedlings um, taking care of them into um, as they advance into maturity I hope that answers the question yeah I think we're often you know really concerned about some of the competing vegetation that might also grow after the seedlings are initially established it can take them two or three years right to overtop a lot of that and so we also want to address address that. And right. um, another question that was asked here is, is, you know, do we do that with mechanical means or chemical means, or what what would you suggest so for those those follow up release treatments? Yeah. So this this really goes I I out of my area of expertise. So um, I I. <sighs> I wish that I could just refer you to some of your other, your fellow woodland owners here. So um, it really does um, depend on you and your objectives here. So um, say that question again here. So uh, I don't see it here in my, in my list. I should have jotted it down. Where's my Q&A? Um, I think, well, I may have uh, already moved it over to the answered question side, but- the... I, I got a little lost in that question. Can you just repeat it for me, please, Ryan? Yeah, so the question was, the first question was about, you know, what we're talking about when we're talking about a release treatment and then um, how we're accomplishing that. So is, it, is that done mechanically? Is that done with a chemical treatment, et cetera? Right. So, um, yeah, so um, I would encourage you to talk to your extension force with that. This is a little bit out of my area of expertise, and this isn't something that I've done before. So um, you can get your best information um, from from your neighbors and from a, um, an extension force who can help you uh, more on this. Do you have anything that an expertise on this, Ryan, that you want to give some input on? Well, I, I mean, I would say that it's uh, it's both. It's ju just like the the uh, pre-planting uh, preparation. You know, you might pursue both mechanical and and or um, chemical uh, treatments. And there again, it depends on the site and the conditions and what you're up against. Um, and also, you know, probably how large of a unit you're working with. If it's something smaller, it's probably more manageable manageable to to work on a, uh, a mechanical release of some kind. Um, something larger might require um, using use of an herbicide. Right. Um, and that, that that relates to another question, which I don't know the answer to, and I don't know if, if you uh, will or not, Dan, the question about what the best kind of herbicide is uh, to prep a site so that it, you don't impact the seedlings. 
Right, yeah. So um, w I'm not a licensed pesticide applicator, so that's not the type of question that I could answer. Um, so um, again, I want to refer you to that resource available, the Pacific Northwest Weed Management um, Handbook, and um, that's available for purchase. Um, see if you might be able to get a used copy on Amazon or elsewhere and um, have a look at that. Um, you can also, it, your extension forester in your county might be a licensed um, 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 uh, uh, pesticide application or not. So um, there are some other resources out, um, out there um, for um, assistance with this. Um, your soil and water conservation districts um, in your county, um, you could call them up and talk to them and they might be able to help you work out some, some, um, some herbicides that would be best for you in your area and the type of vegetation that you want to control. Um, and, and they just have the ability to do that where I don't because I don't have that, that license. I'm in the same place uh, and I would add to your list of folks uh, that could help also the ODS uh, stewardship forester responsible for your area. Uh, those folks can also help answer those those questions as well on a site specific uh, basis. Yes, and forgive me um, for leaving that one out. Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, let's see, looking at some more questions here. Um, do you need to leave a planting clearance around existing stumps? So you, you, you'd showed a graphic um, and you'd kind of showed the right places and the wrong places to plant. And so I think this question is really about how close to a stump should you plant? Yeah, well, you know, um, it depends on, it depends, right, on, on your site. So, I mean, you don't want to put it, you know, right up, well, you might want to put it right up next to it if you want some kind of protection there, um, you could do that. Um, you know, it depends on how old that stump is too, right? Um, and so uh, one thing I would caution against is just, you know, um, just some root competition. And um, if it's a more recent harvest, I guess you have some time since that, that, that um, since that, when that stump was put there. Um, but, you know, those stumps could be beneficial when you're planting near them. Um, for those those little micro climate kind of micro site kind of um, impacts there, so it really does depend on on those all those components that we talked about and and how you plant those there. And um, um, gosh, there's a lot of expertise here in, in this in this group um, um, who could share some more of that information too. Um, did you have anything else to add to that one, Ryan? I don't. Uh, that that is outside of my area of experience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. I'm I'm actually a social scientist who just happens to work in forestry. So I the things I know I you know just picked up along the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate your help. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, so we got a couple of questions now coming back to um, wildlife and and browse damage. Uh, one person asks if blood meal is a good deer repellent. Oh gosh, I don't know about that one. Is blood meal a good um, repellent? Yeah, I have to say, I don't know that one. I'd have to check in on that one. Um, that's just, um, that's not something that I know. I'm sorry. I, I can't offer anything. I know my mom has uh, tried many different solutions on her property down in Southern Oregon and um, none of them seem to work particularly well. So <laughs> I don't know if she's tried blood meal, but. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the next question in the same kind of uh, subject area is, uh, can you talk more about the types of netting or barriers to protect seedlings? Um, you know, just some of the different options that might be out there and uh, what sort of maintenance might be required with those, that kind of thing. Yeah, well, um, again, I have, I have some limited experience on this, but I have had a few calls since I've been here, since I've been on the job about some people who are, you know, interested in planting and, you know, up here on the North Coast, people do have issues with elk and, um, and um, so, you know, some folks have been struggling with, with, with some of those things. So um, the word that I got, and I did talk to Alicia Christensen about this too, and some other people, um, um, some of my, of my colleagues, you know, what, what are you hearing? What works best for, for landowners? And, um, um, I, I, you know, you, you talk to your, your, your neighbors. I've said that several times. Um, um, that's something, uh, just a great resource there for you. Um, but, you know, I've just been, uh, the, the response that I've been getting is just that there's, I mean, they really are effective, those, um, those mesh um, um, protectors um, from browse in particular. But just keep in mind that some pests will go in there and still root those up and they could still walk over those and trample on them. So um, it will protect it um, as, you know, um, 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 as, 
as best as I, I guess it depends on that big old animal that might be stomping through there. Um, so, um, and some other, I've heard of some other options that some people were trying. Um, um, and um, I don't know, I just would say be creative. You're gonna have to try to experiment with a couple of different things um, and find out what works best for you. Um, I have a landowner down in Lincoln County who has, it's just a small acreage and um, they don't have a lot to tend. So they're trying a bunch of, um, you know, things that shoot water out at, at the deer when they come up close. And, um, you know, like I said, they don't have a lot of acres that they're, they're, um, they're protecting and they don't have a lot of seedlings there. So that, that's a little bit more practical for them. Um, but, you know, something that's going to protect from browse and um, um, is, is what you're looking for in, in that situation. Um, and so um, there are a couple other options out there available, but the, from what I've heard, that seems to be the most reliable one. Ask around, ask around, talk, talk to um, um, where you're picking up your seedlings and, and ask them you know, what they recommend and they might have some localized ex, um, experience and some knowledge to share with you. Um, let's see, we've got, so we're coming up right on 4.30 and which is sort of the official end of the uh, webinar, but we'll continue going. We've got, uh, I think about four more questions in here. We'll try to answer. Um, the next one, um, says that uh, this, uh, the person asking the question did some planting uh, back in the day using a dibble and container stock and was wondering um, if you know anything about how that particular technique has, has played out over the years, if that turned out to be an effective way. It was, easy, it was an easy way um, to get the trees in the ground, but were those successful or not? Gosh, yeah, I wish I had just some something to share with that and I don't but I've written this down here. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I'm going to look into this and see um, and do some research on this because this is the first I've heard of that. Um, so um, uh, yeah, I, I wish I had something to, to give you on that and, and I don't. So um, if you want to follow up with me, I, I'll be looking into this and asking around um, by all means. And that goes for anyone here too. You know, I um, 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 Give your extension forester a call if you want to work through something more in detail and, and that includes me too. So um, I may not be the most um, the biggest expert in this field, but I'm connected with people who are and um, it's just that they're just a phone call away. And so we can get you all the, the advice that you need and all the input that can help you through all of these situations. So please give us a call. Okay. <laughs> So we're uh, returning back now to competition and um, invasive species. And we've got a couple of uh, comments here just around uh, scotch broom in particular is kind of what I'm seeing come out of this. Uh, I, I, I think we all know that pretty well. In fact, this time of the year, it's very visible. You see that nice bright yellow out there on the landscape um, and something that gets pretty big and can overtop your trees pretty quickly. Um, so one person just sharing the experience that they did some site prep with a ground machine and the scotch broom quickly filled in. And then the next person kind of asking um, if you are in that situation where you where your trees really have been overtopped, is there any other way besides mechanical removal of, of say the scotch broom in this case uh, to um, treat to treat that? Yeah, that scotch broom, man, it sure is pretty and has a, such a well, you can like the smell or it can be a little bit overpowering, but it is just everywhere right now, it seems, and it is out in full force. And if you've ever worked with Scotch broom, you know that it's a bit of a booger to deal with. And um, they're just really tenacious roots and um, you need special tools to deal with it. So I, you know, that that's just a tough one to deal with. So um, that's again, a little bit out of my expertise of how to deal with that Scotch broom once it's in there and, and affecting your seedlings, um, you know, um, timing and, and application of herbicide, you know, might be tricky and it all depends on your site there. Um, you know, I would want to um, see what your site looked like, what you're dealing with, and, and bring in someone who has a little bit more expertise to, to help you out with that because you want to make sure um, that you do it right and that you're um, able to open up that, that site for your seedlings. Um, and um, I just have to say, I feel for you that that stuff takes over um, and it's really hard to get rid of once, once it's established. So um, yeah, I, I would have to follow up on that one. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what would work best in that situation. Yeah, and I, I, I know uh, several examples uh, that I'm aware of where uh, mechanical disturbance uh, can often prepare a nice seed bed for scotch broom to come in and uh, particularly in some of these uh, Western Oregon counties that where, where, where we've been talking so. 
Yeah, and fire, I mean, they just are such prolific seeders, and I mean, that they're weeds, so that this is what they do, right? They're tenacious, and they, they grow quickly, and they quickly take over a site. So, um, yeah, good good conservation goal for Oregon and the Pacific Northwest and everywhere in general is where this is not native, is to minimize that, that um, pest species as much as we can. It, it's everywhere up here in, in the North Coast in particular. So the last question is a pretty specific situation. Um, and so it might be one of those where it's good to make a phone call to the local extension forester or stewardship forester. Uh, but the, the question is really about Limit Valley Ponderosa pine. Um, yeah. And the person posting uh, mentioned that they planted some Ponderosa, some valley pine. So we call it Valley Ponderosa pine because it's a little bit different from what we see on the east side of the state. And they planted some about 25 years ago and it's now mostly died. Um, and so asking uh, what the next uh, step might be uh, in terms of a different species uh, and western red cedar is one that's been suggested to them and they're curious if you have any suggestions at all. Red cedar, well okay so um, so this was 25 years and so I'm assuming that this was you know I'd have to assume that this was a site that was suitable for growing these ponderosa that it was you know, more of a drier site and um, ponderosa pine and pines in general, like, you know, open growing, they like sunshine. Um, so, you know, I'd be curious to know about those things, what might be going on. I'm curious about why they did die. You said they were 25 years old. Um, were they stunted in growth? Um, did you see into any indications of any kind of um, decreasing crown or, you know, did your crown get thin? Um, did you get, um, it's called lion's tailing when you have some, some um, drought stress or some root stress where most of the needles on your branch, branches will fall off except the ones on the end, very end of your branches and it makes a little feature, it's like a lion's tailing that would indicate that there's some kind of root problem. Um, it's really hard to know what, why those died and, you know, I'm a forest health specialist so um, I'd want to get to the bottom of that first. Um, and really, um, is there something at your site? You know, is there something in your soil? I mean, it was there for 25 years and something happened. So um, that is something that, you know, I would want to investigate and find out that first. And then you can ask that question, well, what can we plan if there was something, you know, there might be something, how many acres of it was affected also? Um, you know, how many of your, your trees were impacted? Was this a little localized issue? Was your mortality all in one spot in your forest? Was it ubiquitous across, across all of your 25 year old forest? Um, you know, those are all, uh, that's all information that could help um, kind of pinpoint what may have contributed to the mortality of the ponderosa pine and um, just I have to say I'm sorry that that's you know a lot of effort and money and time and um, hard work and blood sweat and tears to, to get those in the ground and taken care of so when something like that happens it's just devastating so I'm really sorry that that happened first of all and um, yeah I would really just like to talk to you more um, um, you're in the valley there so uh, maybe you can reach out to one of your extension foresters there who could problematize this for you and or with you and um, kind of walk you through that and then we can make a, a recommendation of um, you know if you know, maybe it was the wrong um, um, seedling that was, or the stocking type that was planted there. And it seemed to be doing well in the beginning, but then, you know, as, as things progressed, it didn't do so well there yet. Um, lots, of, lots of questions I have there, but this is something that we could help you with, um, extension foresters, and can help you get to the bottom with and sleuth these issues. And, and then um, we can work on some recommendations together and what um, you can plant. It might be that you can plant ponderosa pine back there if you want, um, and if, if that works well for you, and, and that's what you want, and it suits your objectives. So give us a call. We'd love to talk about more, uh, talk to you more about that kind of a question. Well, great. Uh, that, I think, is all the questions that I've seen in the Q&A, and I don't know that there's anything else in the chat. Uh, those were some tough questions, some very specific questions. I think this is the type of presentation that uh, is, is, yeah, pretty well suited for that. So, <laughs> uh, but I think your, your message was, uh, you know, well, well received, which is that there are a lot of experts around the state and it's really good to reach out to somebody locally who, who knows the, the site and the area where you live.
That's right. And I just want to give another plug. Um, you know, we have so many resources available for you and also opportunities to learn more um, in other classes. So I mentioned the Master Woodland Management Program. You know, that's an extensive course that um, um, you can um, enroll in and you'll get a lot of this information that I covered today, but in a lot more detail. Um, Oregon State Extension um, also has a, for, a basic forestry short course um, where um, um, uh, similar information is given here on, on reforestation as well as some other things. Um, it's a little bit more of an intro, but um, that basic forestry short course it runs about five to six courses. Um, there's one coming up in Benton and Lane County starting next week, actually. Registration is free. Um, it's a more interactive space. And so this it's really going to be tailored. It's really tailored for people to share information with each other and to get to know people on the on the on in, in on the course. Um, and um, you'll you hopefully find some neighbors in your area who you can bounce off some of this information. So a lot more in-depth discussion on some of these topics we've covered today from people like yourselves who are actually out there doing the, this work um, and, you know, struggling with some of these things and finding solutions to them. So I encourage you to explore those opportunities um, and to seek out that those, um, those other classes that we offer and lots more information to go into. Well, great. And thank you, Dan, for uh, joining us again today. It was a lot of fun and uh, appreciate everybody on the line as well. And I hope you'll join us again uh, next Tuesday. And until then, thank you. Thank you, everybody.